Behavior-driven development is one of those ideas that's become extremely popular, and it's extremely successful as a practice too. However, as a result of its popularity, as usual, it's also ended up being widely misunderstood. I think that BDD can be one of the most straightforwardly effective tools to effect change to, in our approach to software development. But so many teams miss out on these advantages because of these misunderstandings. So what are the common mistakes that people often make and how do we get acceptance testing with BDD right? Hi, I'm Dave Farley. Welcome to the Modern Software Engineering channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content here today, hit like as well. The most common mistake that I see in teams adopting BDD is that they tend to assume that it's all about the tools. The assumption seems to be that if you write your tests in Gherkin, then you're practicing BDD. That's completely wrong. You can write your tests in any language that you like, with any tools that you like and be doing a better job of BDD than many teams using dedicated BDD tools. BDD is very far from being a tool-centric approach. Much more important is what your tests are focused on testing. The tools don't really matter and to be honest I don't think that they help at all if you miss the much more important more fundamentals of BDD. Over the years I've come to believe that the most important idea of all, if we want to achieve successful software development, is to organize everything really as best as we can to keep our eye focused on the outcome that it is that we're trying to achieve rather than the mechanism through which we are attempting to achieve it. With hindsight, I think that we could think of a lot of the ideas in software development from that perspective. They were fundamentally about trying to find ways to keep developers and teams focused on outcomes rather than becoming overly focused on mechanisms. Use cases, user stories, the executable specifications of BDD and acceptance testing, and even ideas like test-driven development, object orientation, and functional programming are really all fundamentally about allowing us to separate our thinking about what our system is meant to do from the detail of how we make it do those things. These two important aspects of software development, what and how, are both, of course, essential, but are represented by very different sets of activities. And software development works best when we separate them, but don't separate them too far. Ideally, we'd like to be able to focus all of our attention on defining the problem that we need to solve. And then, only once we have done that, focus all of our attention on how to solve it. Most teams confuse these two ideas, often by specifying software in terms of the solution rather than the need. This can get so bad that the developers working on the system don't even understand or know what the system is for. There's no way for developers to build great software without understanding the problem that they're working on, and so this is a pretty sure route towards failure. BDD is, in my view, the most powerful tool to help us to maintain this separation sensibly but only if we see it and use it for what it really is. That is, it's all about specification rather than being about testing. Most developers and most teams make the mistake of focusing much too hard on testing the specific detail of their implementation and not enough on validating that the software achieves the desired outcomes. This results in tests that are too tightly coupled to the implementations and so code and tests that are difficult, if not impossible, to change. I think that people make this mistake for two reasons. First, that programming is quite a lot of fun and our primary focus as we learn to be programmers. So writing code is naturally at the forefront of our minds when we're presented with a problem that we might be want asked to solve with software. We jump too soon to solution thinking and don't spend enough time thinking about the problem. This is really quite natural, but also quite profoundly wrong. We aren't going to do a good job of solving a problem if we don't understand what the problem is. Which leads us to the second difficulty. Understanding the problem is usually more difficult than writing the code to solve it. At least once you've got past the coding beginner stage. Let me pause there and thank our sponsors. We're extremely fortunate to be sponsored by Equal Experts, Transfic, 
and Tuple. Transfic is a financial technology company applying advanced continuous delivery techniques to deliver low latency trade routing services to some of the biggest financial institutions in the world. All of our sponsors offer products and services that are extremely well aligned with the topics that we discuss on this channel every week. So if you're looking for excellence in continuous delivery and software engineering in general, then click on their links in the description below and do check them out. Our real job in software is not about writing code, but rather about solving problems for people using software. And then organizing our understanding of the problem is a vital and difficult, in fact, it is the most difficult part of software development. Sure, there can be interestingly tricky parts to solving a problem and finding a neat solution is obviously an important part of what we do. But we don't get to do that without that deep understanding of the problem itself. The kind of deep understanding that allows us to find elegantly simple solutions that we can take real pride in when we find them. Part of the problem here is that the solution to every problem seems simple if you only have a simplistic view of the problem. I can write a basic implementation of Twitter in a day or two if I'm naive enough to only think in terms of the basics of reading about topics that I'm interested in and subscribing to those things. It's only once we start thinking of doing this at global scale and the data volumes and the range of topics uh, that are likely to be involved that the whole stack of world-class complicated problems become more obvious to us. We'll never foresee some of these problems. We'll only discover them once people start using our software for real. So this problem of understanding the problem is very far indeed from being simple. And it's at the very core of successful software development and at the core of successful software businesses too. So to do a great job of software development, we need to be good, organized and disciplined in how we approach the understanding of the problems that we work on so that then we're in the best possible position to come up with those good solution ideas that we're looking for. If we focus only on solutions or focus on solutions too soon, then we're often likely to pick the first overly naive solutions that occur to us. And these first ideas are almost certainly wrong. So we'll probably miss the good solutions that will save us time and money and make our software an easier place to work and so make us more efficient in making changes in future. And instead, we'll end up with naive and hard to live with systems that result in us closing doors to doing a better job in the future and so make it harder to adopt better solutions even when we do recognize the need for them. Let's be absolutely clear about this though. None of this means that we should spend weeks or months agonizing over the requirements before we start writing code, because that doesn't work either. The way that we learn to better understand the problem that we're working on is by working on it, trying stuff out, finding what works and correcting what doesn't. Incrementalism, organizing our work so that we can grow our understanding and our solution small step by small step is fundamental to great software development. And once again, BDD is an enabling approach to adopting that more incremental requirements, problem-focused approach. Think about that for a moment. Let's imagine that we're presented with a problem of some kind that needs a software solution. What's likely to work best? Thinking hard and picking a solution and then developing it to completion or trying something, seeing if it works, correcting the things that don't work and improving the things that do re-evaluating whether our understanding is still correct and then trying something else. In the first case, we have one idea and then we try to implement it. So we have essentially one shot at success. And if we miss, the project's a disaster. But we don't find that out until the project's finished. In the second, we have as many attempts at success as we want. We can check to see if our route towards success still looks viable after every small change that we make. This is, at its roots, how science and engineering work. Clearly, this second approach is more likely to result in success, if only because we have more chances to spot any mistakes. But for this to work, what we really need is a well-defined, ideally easy to create and easy to live with definition of what success means. And this is the real intent of behavior-driven development. 
Let's ignore for a moment the illusion of any perfect specification, because however diligent we are, we're never going to find that. So the best that we can ever do is to try to achieve the best specification that we can for our system as we understand it at this moment. What BDD does is allow us to make our best guess so far of what our system should do and turn this into a concrete self-validating thing. This is a much more powerful idea than thinking hard and getting everything right, right from the start. Because now we have a clear specification of what we want our system to do. We're not going to forget any corner cases or anything because we've either encoded them as specifications or we didn't build them. Which is a much more powerful thing than only a testing our implementation does what we thought it should do. This same specification, because we've created it as an ex executable specification, will now also notify us when our system stops doing the things that it's supposed to do notifying us of our mistakes quickly and allowing us to fill in any gaps or correct any mistakes that we make along the way. Now our lives are easier because now our system's easier to change and easier to grow. This is exactly what behavior-driven development does. We begin by defining the behavior that we think is important. We don't have to get this perfectly right first time because we can easily correct it later. We then use this definition to organize how we work both in terms of how we decide and specify that behavior, but also because we worked to more clearly separate specification from implementation, we gain the freedom to decide how we want to implement that behavior, and then the freedom to change our minds once we have a better idea. Because now, whatever our implementation is, its specification doesn't change. The trick here is to write tests that allow us this freedom to change the implementation while keeping the specification unchanged. We only need to change specifications when our understanding of the problem changes, not when our understanding of what our solution should be changes. If you'd like to learn more about the detail of how to do all of this, do check out my highly acclaimed training course, Acceptance Testing, BDD from Stories to Executable Specifications. Our customers for this course tell us that it's a game changer. The scenarios that we define in BDD are genuine executable specifications for our system. They accurately describe what the system should do under a controlled set of circumstances in a way that allows us to use them to verify that they are actually fulfilled by the system. How to achieve this in terms of tools is kind of irrelevant compared to organizing our work in this way. In fact, my own preference uses very few third-party tools. I tend to build a domain-specific language with no additional tools at all other than my programming language and occasionally a unit test framework. The aim of the DSL is to make it quick and easy to write these specifications, which leads me to the next big stumbling block that is common to teams misusing BDD. That next mistake is to assume that the creation and use of these scenarios is a lot of extra work outside the process of software development, really. Often this takes the form of trying to separate this work and delegate it to a separate group of people, maybe a QA team or something like that, and then them being made responsible for the creation and maintenance of all of these specifications. This is a big mistake for a wide variety of reasons, but most importantly because BDD is about two big things driving the development process from these specifications and establishing more effective, efficient communications between all of the people involved. One of the huge wins for teams that do BDD star acceptance testing effectively is that they achieve a much better understanding of the problem that they're meant to be solving. They better understand what the software is meant to do. That's because this understanding is made evident from the beginning and then grown incrementally feature by feature. By driving the development process this way, you're pretty much forced to collaborate more effectively. Developers work closely with domain experts from the business. Testers work more closely with developers and product owners, and they all work together. They all discuss what the software is meant to achieve. These discussions are detailed and specific defining a set of starting conditions. And given that set of starting conditions, what should then happen when some event occurs? This isn't vague or abstract. 
it's a specific example of how the software should behave under certain patterns of use, certain well-defined patterns of use. If we delegate this work to a separate team, there's now a temptation for things to happen in the wrong order. The tests will maybe be written after the code and so on, and for the wrong people to be working on those things. We want the people solving the problem, the developers, to have the best possible understanding of the problem that they're working on, that we can achieve. We want these specifications, our requirements, to be clear, accurate, and precise. They're clear because they're written as behavioral specifications, clearly expressed descriptions of exactly what should happen under a controlled specific set of circumstances. They're accurate because the specifications describe real uses of the system from the perspective of real users of the system. They're precise because we control the variables in our evaluations of the specifications with a variety of techniques Techniques like test isolation, and by being very specific about the inputs to the scenario and the predicted results. There's a lot to get right here. This is a big change to the way that many teams approach development and automated testing. But when you do get these things right, the rewards are very significant indeed. This technique can dramatically increase the speed and quality of your software development and strongly promotes lots of other good behaviors like encouraging you to adopt a more incremental approach to design and development, while also promoting more determinism in those designs so that you can better control the variables and so better depend on the results that you get from your executable specifications. This approach is so effective that I think it may even represent the future of programming with artificial intelligence, allowing us to more effectively harness and direct AI coding assistance to produce the results that we really need. I talked about this in more detail in this episode. You can learn more about all of these topics and a lot more from our training course. So do check that out, it's in the link below. Thank you very much for watching. And thanks especially to our patron members who support this channel by their patronage. Thank you for your help. And if you're interested in getting lots of early access to videos, videos without any adverts, uh, Q&A shows, and a lot of other benefits, please do consider supporting us through our Patreon community. Thank you.